is it being recorded now yeah um okay. Ishra, it's recording. okay that's perfect okay thank you hi everyone i am ishrat i am a girls network ambassador and i'm very excited to see everyone here today um i'm also a little bit nervous um so to introduce myself, I'll tell you a little bit about my journey with the Girls Network. I was a mentee for a couple of months back in 2019, which was five years ago now. And I became an ambassador after I finished my mentoring program. And I joined the ambassador community, um, which is a safe space with lots of opportunities like internships, work experience and speaking engagements. Um, personally, I have interviewed politicians, visited 10 Downing Street and spoken at many different events with the Girls Network. And currently I am hosting this workshop. So that is fun. Um, I am a student at King's College and I currently study social sciences, which um, a big chunk of it is about politics. Um, so I'm very interested to see what we learn today in today's workshop. Um, I believe in amplifying the voices of young people from marginalized communities like mine and my interests are mainly in policing and education policy. Um, I mentored a senior police officer um, a couple of years ago with the Girls Network and yeah, so that's a little bit about me. Um, now about today, we are joined by Sema, who is a passionate social entrepreneur and the CEO of The Avengers, which is a UK-based charity fighting against gender-based violence. Um, from her beginnings as a visionary born in Turkey to her current role as a government advisor, Sema has been instrumental in shaping policies and leading impactful campaigns with organisations like the FCDO, the Home Office and the Metropolitan Police. Um, I've always had an interest in politics and that has led me to wonder what the world of government advisors is about and how each of us can make a difference. So I would like to pass it on to Sema to talk about her journey. Thank you so much. Um, and yeah, I will first talk about what the Avengers does in depth and then I will move to myself and then how I found myself being a government advisor because... I still can't believe, even myself, <laughs> that it's, it has happened. So the Revengers is a charity committed to ending female genital mutilation, cutting, and all other forms of violence against women and girls. It was co-founded by two amazing women, Mabel Evans, a filmmaker, and Hoda Ali, um, a basic a survivor of FGM, amazing former sexual health nurse, now safeguarding lead. What does she not do? Our co-founders are very, I would say interesting people that you want to look up their cvs it's it's very interesting what they both do you know they do many many things uh, which is what you want to see from women these days um next slide sama right so me very awkward um ishrat i think did a great introduction and when i heard myself from her i was like mm, impressive you know i i think that's a nice thing you know i've done well so I'm a Turkish-British um, social entrepreneur, uh, and I'm a serial entrepreneur. Salma knows me. We work together. I have like 50 hours in a day, so does she. Um, and I like to do so many things. I, you know, just keep busy. But my lifestyle is just creating. And I like to believe in 80% creation, 20% consumption in life. And I feel like that's a healthy balance especially when our you know, planet is dying and there are so many social issues, wars going on, we have got to create. And also being a minoritized woman, I feel like I do need to belong to more and more spaces so that I can represent and then more girl children can grow up to believe that they do belong to these spaces as well. I also run a professional services company, which is all about you know governance and boring stuff nobody wants to talk about, but important stuff. Next one. Yeah, so this is us, um, only a small group of Avengers actually, but there's more of us delivering a report at the House of Lords, um, telling off systems like we do, you know, young women coming together and figuring out things that are wrong with our country. And then we're like, well, we can't just leave it like that. Let's just deliver it to the top. Next one. 
Yeah, so what we do is, I think, very simple. The, to break it down, we provide direct support to women and girls. I will break this down in more detail. We also do campaigning and advocacy, and we also have workshops and education around raising awareness about the issues we, were, we are working on, basically, because unfortunately, people still don't understand what violence against women and girls means. Next one. So our di direct support very much looks like this. You know, we wanted to include some photos to make sure that people actually see what we are talking about. We designed the space um, to suit the needs of, we call them ghost society, because there are a group of women and girls who are completely unseen, unheard, dismissed, systemically challenged and discriminated. So we designed these pop-up community support centers for any woman or girl and their children. And unfortunately, girls do have children as well. And we provide well-being sessions, survivor-led workshops, educational talks. And then we also create like a mini shopping where they can come and take any brand new items like period products, baby items, hygiene items like shampoos, anything that we may have, like, you know, seasonal, for example, clothing in winter, blankets, if we get them. And then they can kind of see this space as a refuge, like a temporary space to... I guess, seek support, but also freeze any problems they have in their heads, but see a systemic support. Because they, what they do is they fill in a form when they visit the space after the amazing workshop, they get their wellness. But what we also do is we do handholding, almost like parenting. We refer them to essential services, over 150 partners we work with. We refer women and girls to food banks if they're hungry and they can't have access to food. Employment, for example, SmartWorks is a great organization of ours, you know, partner of ours. Um, and we've referred so many women to them. They gave them clothing, taught them like interview skills, read their CVs, very like essential things to basically, basically to make getting out of abuse very sustainable. Because we can't just say to women and girls, hey, you can end the you know, cycle of abuse in your generation if you are not addressing the root problems. And it's very important that we give women freedom, financial freedom, you know, migration freedom, if they don't have their legal papers in order, all of that is really important. And then we do that by basically simple partnerships, in our opinion. So we act like a database. Next one. Um, so this is like a breakdown of last year's data. Um, our visitors basically reported facing FGM, 85% of them followed by emotional, psychological abuse. And if you can define this as well, because not everyone can actually define it instantly that they are going through these forms of abuse, which is really worrying. And I think our generation made a breakthrough in defining abuse, even terms like, you know, gaslighting, ghosting. We are learning these terminologies that are really important that we should know. And we were just thinking when we saw this data, even being a survivor-led organization, how can someone go through this many forms of abuse and still walk through life being okay? And how is there no systemic way of actually sorting this out, which is how I found myself in advisory world. I have a feeling that our programs work really well because we bring so many women and girls together. And from my lived experience of living in poverty and abuse, when something happens to you, I guess you don't have that much of compassion towards yourself because it's happening to you on an ongoing basis and you're kind of like systemically numb to it because you have asked for help or you've been put in that situation. And then when you see other people in the same situation, say a friend or someone in the community in school, you feel so bad for them. And you're like, well, how come someone has you know beaten you up, forced you into marriage? How come someone could perform FGM on you? But what you don't really think about that, about yourself, if that makes sense. This is why our spaces works really, really well, because there's that sisterhood and compassion that we feel for each other. And we just ask women, you know, do, do you feel that way about yourself as well? And women are like, do you know what? I haven't thought about this because I have just been surviving and worrying and caring about others my entire life. So this picture is actually not that unusual and many women growing up I knew faced a lot of these forms of abuse at the same time right in front of my eyes and that made me really worry why are our governments across the world across the globe not worrying about this in a more systemic way how can we allow as uh, societies you know tax-funded governments to for this to happen 
to a girl child or a woman. Next one. Next one, please. Yeah, so majority of our visitors, when we uh, um, collect data, they said they basically fear government. There's a lack of trust. They've either been to authorities and didn't get help. They've been dismissed. It's very systemic. So, you know, there is that lack of trust and the existing fear on an ongoing basis. And what we try to do is we try to challenge that in a more up top level when enough women come to us and they share their concerns and worries, then we go back to the government and say, hey, did you actually know this is what community thinks about you? Because sometimes government systems can be very disconnected, being in a you know big fancy building. And if MPs are not connected to their communities, if you know their social status, let's say situation, financial situation changed massively, even if they were coming from, you know, let's say a poverty background like myself it's very easy to be disconnected I think with a community unless you are with the community at all times and this is why MPs actually should be very connected with their communities at all times understanding who they are representing um 96 percent of the people I think this data slightly changed now because this last year data they felt more confident to talk about their problems instantly after a single workshop and that just tells how good you know our work is and the survivor-led approaches because when someone who's been there done that and who's been through to the bright side tells you there's hope about you that you shouldn't be written off in a systemic way then you can start to believe in yourself too and i think that's what our workshops do next one so on average we help about thousand women and girls per year and then their children um, and this is direct support. We give them access to a safe space when they can talk about abuse they are facing or their family members. We give them essential items like I've explained. And then we also give them support to, for them to live an abuse-free life. Like I said before, we don't just say, hey, let's just end this. We are like, okay, let's look into why we can't end this in your family. Let's address the issues together so that you can actually end it. And then your children, if you have them, can be also free. Next one. So our campaigning work is very much about looking at numbers. And in, in our ca campaign's case, unfortunately, there are not that many numbers. And that's, that's, that's the whole problem. Nobody knows how many survivors of FGM are there in the UK, in England and Wales. And this is based on 2014 data, by the way. There's 137,000 women and girls living with FGM. And there's further 60,000 girls under the age of 15 who are at risk. And this is the official government data. But in our hubs, we have seen, for example, women coming through to us and saying, oh, when I was 18, I thought, you know, FGM wasn't going to happen to me. I was safe from this abuse. But I turned 19 and then my parents took me to cut. And so we know it's not just children, girl children who are at risk of FGM. It's also adult women who are at risk of FGM. And we know these numbers are not right because we're not asking women if they are survivors of FGM, which is a problem in itself. Next one, please. Yeah, so you can see we're everywhere, sort of, you know, at membership clubs, event spaces, you know, speaking with every single member of the public. And we also, we've been on TV recently on BBC, which is very, you know, great, look us uh, up. Um, challenging, you know, MPs and their views on this basically lack of data that we are facing and the lack of support towards FGM survivors. We also go around the world sometimes next month, for example, I will be going to New York to attend UN conference and then Salma will be a delegate um, supporting the UN Women Network. So we do a lot of work, I would say mostly UK based, but also sometimes on a global scale. Next one, please. And our education is very much, you know, either grassroots partnership education or education of members of the public. We organize legal clinics. We really like empowering young women and girls and also boys and men too. Um, we support frontline grassroots organizations or sometimes one person shows, you know, some somebody wants to be an activist and we sort of teach them how to do that in a really systemic way. But the lessons that we learned, because we've been at this for 10 years and we built the partnerships, we're like, hey, why should you do this on your own like we did? We had a lot of friends, a lot of people who helped us. Then maybe we can also share the knowledge that we had and all the connections and partnerships that we built with you. 
So one example is we were able to put together a legal clinic last summer and it will repeat this summer as well if anybody wants to attend limited spaces, but we can give them this amazing support. So Latham Watkins and JP Morgan lawyers actually provided an amazing legal clinic to our attendees, grassroots leaders, and they got really good legal support. Some of them were able to switch their social enterprises to charities, making their organizations more reputable, or they had legal challenges that they were facing, and they were all supported through these amazing organizations free of charge. So that's the kind of education we will do, as well as hosting events. Any events from like 20 people attending up to like 300 was I think our maximum attendee which, you know, there was a queue up to the tube station. We didn't expect that. But we really like organizing events because you can only create awareness through creative events, If especially if you're talking about something nobody wants to talk about. And I, I do think there's a fatigue around talking about social issues these days. So we want to say, hey, don't forget about the people who are suffering. We still need to keep talking about these issues and do something about it. And that's why we constantly put on events. Next one, please. And yeah, I wanted to put together some pictures if anybody wants to see. This is what government advisory looks like. A lot of wearing suits um, and yeah, a lot of wearing black, I notice. I don't know why I do that. Um, and then, yeah, a lot of talks, attending summits, attending online meetings. I would say majority of the work happens reading documents. So it will be half, half, half attending online meetings and then half attending in-person meetings and in-person meetings could be anything that that particular institution is working on. So in this picture, for example, you will see me in the middle. Uh, I'm at a Crown Prosecution Service event. I really like collaborating with Crown Prosecution Service, particularly because they throw the best educational events with anyone in their employment team in charge of violence against women and girls. And then you're really able to connect with those who are actually doing the work right in front of them in an in-person audience. Um, so they also have panels, which I will get into in a minute, like every other organization. And then you're really able to sit down and shape, you know, legislation. You can shape campaigns that they have, have a say on the budgets on, you know, two bad words that you see, which is really interesting. Next one, please. And yeah, this is our one of our co-founders, Hada Ali. I hope you get to meet her one day in our events. If you come, her energy can't be matched. So I hope you do meet her. Um, these are, I think, all the slides that I have. What I want to do now is close the screen and have a more interactive you know, time talking about my experience as an advisor and why I ended up here. Do you want to stop sharing it, Salma? If you can, right. Yeah, so uh, how I ended up here, I think that would be really useful to share with people why I'm doing what I'm doing, because ideally I would love to be a full-time fashion designer in an ideal world without war or problems, but we know that's not the case. Um, I grew up near Syrian border in Turkey, and every single woman before me were forced into child marriage, and they were modern slaves. So they were subjected to various forms of slavery and trafficking, being bought and sold for land, their identity being changed like no big deal, being forced into marriage. And these are major human rights breaches that happened right in front of me. And people tried to normalize it as I was a girl child, you know, trying to find my agency. And your agency is constantly chipped away in the kind of environment I grew up in. Every day I tried to build my agency and have a say in things girly don't talk too much sit down don't look up there was no chin up for me at all it was always looked down to the point sometimes we joke with my sister saying I'm so grateful that we had such lovely carpeting design because we had to study it a lot looking down and we couldn't look at people's faces you know when they were around and that was really sad in itself that you know we even have to think about these things it's very traumatizing that you would be treated any different just because of your gender which is really sad um but yeah we live in times where your identity decides whether you could be alive or not which is really worrying and growing up in that environment I thought to myself I don't want to end up in the same destiny you know I don't want to be like my mother and that's a really sad thing to say and I would always tell my mother I don't want to be like you mom is that really bad but I want to be like your personality but I don't want to end up like how you ended up. And she would always say, you, sh you shouldn't be like me. I'm working so hard so that none of my girls 
have to be like me. And that's a very sad thing to say because my mom had no freedom at all. She was bought and sold since she was, you know, age two or three, a baby basically. And then she was sold to my father, forced marriage when she was just a child, trafficked to, you know, Turkey, living in a country she knows nothing about and have to adjust and be a slave for the entire household, cook and clean for them. When she was just a child, she was forced to get pregnant you know, with my older sister. And then she was forced to get more and more children in her tummy so that she could give birth to a boy child, which didn't happen. Um, and maybe there's a reason why that didn't happen. Potentially, we could have another perpetrator man in our family because of how that boy would have been raised, which is really worrying. So I'm one of the four girl children. I'm the third one. And unfortunately, I'm the first person ever in my entire family history to have gotten a bachelor's degree. And that's a really sad thing to say. I'm really not proud to share this. And I think just like that, I'm also not proud to say I'm one of the first government advisors in many spaces I went to because of age, either legal status or it's just very worrying that that would be the case. And growing up, I thought to myself, do you know what? I will go to university. Whatever happens, I will get an education. And once I went to university, thankfully, about uh, with the support of my mother and all the other amazing women around me, um, I ensured that my sister would be the second to get a bachelor's degree, which is what happened. I supported her to get a bachelor's degree as well. She moved to the other side of the country. She was also really hardworking, tried her best to basically get out of what was written for us, as people said. And then we also moved my mother and, you know, then my sister's freedom was okay as well. And then after that, my sister ended up doing a master's degree in Germany. I'm really proud that I've also supported her to do that. But yeah, she'd work really hard for that. So, you know, writing a thesis in Germany, when they like printing stuff, every single thing is very difficult. I mean, you don't speak German and try to print something at a German university. I saw her problems through her eyes, which was really sad. That's for another day. So yeah, that, that was my journey. And I moved to the UK nearly a decade ago, not knowing anything, you know, typical migrant story, pennies in the pocket. I literally had pennies in my pocket. Like, I don't remember how much money I had, but I had no money to buy on the flight here. Just, just so you know, I came here starving. And same as my husband, he was a graduate engineer at the time, making nearly no money at all. It's like, how is this legal what they're paying you? Well, look, I don't know. And together we built a life and we worked really hard to make sure that we would change what people expected of us. You know, young people who are no good for nothing, they're not going to achieve anything because they're not from, you know, Oxbridge. They're not meant to achieve these things. But I really strongly disagree with that. I do understand there are systemic challenges and disadvantages we are facing, but I believe in working extra hard as a minoritized migrant woman so that others like me can also achieve that. And I feel I have a certain responsibility to do that. So because the system is not there for us to achieve, is it? Um, and build systems so that more and more of disadvantaged people can be okay, because that's all we want people to be okay. And then I worked in various institutions and nonprofits. And I then started my own company. After I started my company, I came across Avengers. I was just like, oh my God, this is everything I believed in. This is so amazing. All the amazing women. I went crazy, right? Um, and same, you know, when I met the team, they we were all like, yes, you know, sisterhood, girl power. And I was appointed to be their second CEO ever. And I've been doing it for the past two and a half years. So the founding team has done an amazing work, laying groundwork. You know, they built an amazing network of people, have done systemic things. They were one of the first people to get, you know, I think as a new charity of that age to get a home office grant even. So there were some relationships already with the government, great relationships when I've arrived. When I've arrived, I before, you know, building the support hub program that I mentioned, there were a lot of works locally happening, but I thought, why don't we do this pan London, London wide, right? Go everywhere and be like a, I don't know, like a supermarket for people's needs, for women's and girls' needs. They can just drop in and get themselves sorted out, right? We need to do this on a systemic level. And then once we started hitting bricks, basically, walls, um, I was like, well, it's not really your issue that you're going through this. And as a charity, it's not really our issue 
what do we do? This is very challenging and it's very systemic, right? And then we started taking it to government level, which we have done in the past as well. But I figured out there are these stakeholders and advisory groups in the government and they are available to nonprofit people. I was like, hmm, so how do I get myself in there, right? Trying to figure out the system. They were like, hmm, you have to be like nominated or applied. Nobody knew, even people who got, I was like, how did you get on there? How on earth have you gotten on there? And they were like, I don't remember, you know, it was all, you know, and I was like, well, what's the way? Do, do I apply? Is there like a link published publicly? And they're like, actually not. Good question. It should be available publicly. So I found a lot of people looking on LinkedIn, on Twitter, or just from pictures, you know, on Twitter, people going to Mayor of London meeting. How did you get on there? And then people were really kind and helpful, networked enough, you know, hustling and said can you also nominate for my charity to like join this thing and we can also advise them like i said we already had some existing relationships as well and then i reached out to them and them and said hey do you have more stakeholder partner groups as well for us to be able to join and they were like yeah some of them are individual based so they will take individuals and they're volunteering because these are non-paid, by the way, which is another problem in itself. I hope that it will be resolved at some point. Some of them are kind enough to pay you your, you know, tube and they will buy you a sandwich. I mean, most institutions do not buy a good sandwich, though. So bring your own food if you can. I haven't been, as a Turkish woman, I haven't been pleased with the tea or the sandwich in these meetings. And I'm like, sorry, you know, this is the only passive aggressive thing I do. I bring my own tea and coffee to the government meetings because they're just terrible. Um, so, yeah, um, very unexpected. I joined, I think I ended up having eight seats in total by now, which I didn't know could happen. I went to one meeting, joined one stakeholder group, advisory group. And then somebody there was like, wow, you're making so much sense as a young woman. We didn't know young people had this many great ideas. Like, yeah, we do. You know, you need to give us more platform and, you know, microphone, amplify our voices. We do have great opinions and we can help you build that amazing law or project that you're talking about and help you save a lot of money as well and represent our communities. And I also brought in a lot of people because every time I join somewhere, like I said, if I'm the first to do something, I get really bothered about that. I don't want to be the token person doing something. And I'd like to address that I'm not alone as well. So I bring in more people from different backgrounds, from my background, if it's under 30, let's say, if it's, you know, over 30, but, you know, they don't have, the, let's say, the older generation or younger generation, people who are migrants, for example, migrants' voices are heavily underrepresented. And as a first-generation migrant who came to this country, on my own, I feel so bothered reading the news. I look at the news and we are wildly misrepresented. Migrants are made to look like people who don't want to pay rent, who don't want to pay, you know, taxes. They just want free. That's not true at all. Not true at all. Migrants are extremely hardworking because you haven't got generations of people who left you stuff. You haven't got family here often or you have a tiny family those who could make it here, right? Some of your family, potentially, for majority of migrants, this is true, died in a war, in a natural disaster. And it's really sad that you have to carry that survivor's guild badge on your shoulder like a chip, while also having to work and overperform and overcome every single difficulty that's thrown at you. And even at workplace, you know, and many, I worked in many, many big to small workplaces. And every single place I went to, I realized migrants had to put in more hard work, even if it wasn't mentioned verbally, that was just the norm that you had to do that because if something was to happen, you would be the first to go. You know, that was the vibe that was given to us, which is really sad. Um, so when I discovered this advisory roles, I was really shocked to see how many migrants weren't there, not were there, weren't there. And I always said, hey, where are migrants? Like, oh, I don't know. We we couldn't find anyone. And, you know, there needs to, uh, okay, that's not good enough, is it? Let's let's address this. And I just go around and bring a village of people and say, how many people did you need? Look, you have some empty seats. Can we extend this table and put some more chairs here? I think we can. Don't worry about the sandwich budget. We don't want sandwich. You know, we'll bring our own if it means that we can bring more voices in the room. 
And there are a few routes, but the routes that I know of and I have basically pursued is one, public engagement tips. All these big organizations, Home Office, Metropolitan Police, Crown Prosecution Service, you know, Department for Education, they will all have a public educate public engagement team in charge or external communications. There are only a few titles that they hold. It's either mostly external communications or public engagement team. And you can reach out to them and say, hey, do you have stakeholder advisory groups? And if yes, can I join? This is my CV. This is my organization. If you have an organization or if you work at an organization, then you say, this is my CV. This is my organization. Can I join? And then they will say, hey, we have some intakes in the coming months, yada, yada, or these are our rules. We need to run some clearances on you, see that you've done enough work. I would heavily recommend piling a really good CV together and then showcase all of your work. So if you have video proof of your work, campaigns that you worked on, anything impressive you have done, and most these days, young people do a lot, like they don't do 24 hour days. So I would say just showcase what you're doing. If you have a great social media, great, you know, go tag along with that with your CV, send it to them. And then you will likely go through a very horrendous long, long term process. On average, they take at least three months to join anyway. Um, and then the other route would be the gov.uk published route. So sometimes government will pay people to review some work, legislation, projects, a big government related work, basically, that concerns member of the, members of the public, but specifically experts in that field. And there are various fields. It's anything from engineering to like balancing as women and girls and they will publish particular roles that for a limited um series group that they set up and you can apply for these jobs on public appointments on gov.uk and then you will go through you know the whole interview process like you would do at any other job they don't always tend to be full-time which is great because if even if you hold a full-time job you could actually speak to your line manager if it's one day a week or two days a month and that could be arranged if you work at a great place I think most workplaces actually shouldn't challenge you if they say no. And I would say challenge that if such a great opportunity comes up. And then there's other route is, I would say, soul activism or charity route. So it works really well with the reaching out to the public engagement. Like I said, if you are working at a nonprofit or you have your own nonprofit, you started one or you're a soul activist, you're not registered anywhere. You want your voice to be heard about a particular issue then you reach out to these routes and then, you know, you can be given a seat. The terrible thing about being a volunteer is it's being, well, because you're not being paid. So how you could make up for your time is by getting grants. If you are working at a charity or if you have your own charity, I would strongly suggest that you put campaigning as a number one thing on your, you know, or number two, two thing on your website. And then you can actually go for grants for your time to be funded. If you're getting paid on Fridays, let's say, and those meetings are on Friday, you're getting paid. And that volunteering within that time, if it fits under the nonprofit's time, is great. And I would encourage many young people to do that. And in my organization, any person who's doing advisory during their time, they are being paid because it, it suits the charity's agenda, ending violence against women and girls. And if you are advising on those you know, lines, Perfect. Go for the meeting. So this is everything I have to say. I think it's good to have Q&A now. Um, thank you so much. That was amazing. That was so insightful and so helpful. Um, and I'm sure our ambassadors really enjoyed that. So I would like to yeah, hand it over to the ambassadors. If anyone has any questions, you can, I think, leave them in the chat or send them to Rabina or you can even raise your hand on Zoom um, and then unmute and ask your questions. Um, I think someone asked, how challenging do you find it being a government advisor? Question, challenging or frustrating? 
the right question. I think it's both very positive and very challenging, I would say, because if you are a government advisor, say, about violence against women and girls, that means that that issue is very persistent and exists in that country, hence why it's very challenging and frustrating, and that it hasn't been resolved before advisors came along and, you know, said their piece, basically. And I would say these roles are very important. And a lot of organizations actually do see the value of this. I've had very positive experience with various government departments, to be completely frank with you. They were really appreciative of the feedback. And do you know what? They did admit saying, hey, we find your work incredibly impactful. Thank you for supporting us getting this right, because we haven't gotten it right for a long time. And that makes me feel really good. And it makes the whole work, I think, worth doing. But it's also challenging for that reason. You know, why do we have FGM as an issue when we have this much money that we could have funding to support women and girls? Why do we have poverty? You know, why do we still have wars? And I think that in itself is very frustrating that we still, you know, in 2024 have to do that. Thank you. And we have, I think, Hillary had her hand up. Yeah, I did. I was going to type it as well, but I can say it. Um, I guess my question is, first of all, thank you for speaking to us. Um, it was really inspiring to hear everything you said. And I guess my question is, how do you like build confidence when you're going into rooms where you feel like people probably have a preconceived notion of you? Like, how do you remain like calm and composed in spaces where I, I don't really know how to articulate the question well but I, I feel like I get you Hillary mm -hmm. I'm a minoritized woman right people expect angry mad crazy woman mm -hmm. I speak exactly with this tone in many rooms yet some people are like why are you shouting like I'm not shouting I'm speaking exactly and because we still have racism xenophobia and microaggression you know mm -hmm. anyone may deny it I think we have it in every single room unfortunately and I really really struggle keeping myself in my head I'm like we must live in an alternative universe mm -hmm. where saying something really terrible and racist in such scale and such room is okay surely not and mm -hmm. sometimes you have to be that person calling it out and explaining what you just said is unacceptable it's racist it's sexist it's it's promoting hate speech and you cannot say that you have to be firm sometimes i found myself being really oh that's enough of that right mm -hmm. i won't allow you to say that and i would also say i'm actually writing a book about my experience of you know being in this strange world because sometimes people will say horrendous things near me because I'm wearing a nicely ironed suit and I made it to that space and they will speak really terribly of minoritized people or migrants and when I say hey I'm a migrant I am that person you're describing right now you know the free grabbing I'm not that hey, I'm a minoritized woman, you should not be saying that. And people get really, are you? But you're one of the good ones. And then you have to explain why that's problematic in itself as well. I would say building a community is really important. I have a great support system. So if you want to do this, you need grit, right? Mm -hmm. It's not easy at all. If anybody's selling this job like a fairy tale, it's not at all easy. You have to have great friendships. You have to have a great household a very peaceful household. If you have existing domestic violence in your house, I don't know how I would do it if my house wasn't in peace, for example. Because at the end of the day, if I've been in a frustrating meeting where racism was performed, and it happened many times, and you come home, you just want that peace of mind. And you want to have those friends you can vent to. You want, you want to have a therapy every now and then you need it. A good wellness system. You know, I... Someone knows this. I, I pay a lot of money to spa. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I think it should be included in the budget for some people to like relax because it's so <laughs> tense, right? Wellness should be included in these jobs. And I go to spa a lot. And I think that support system and personal 
building grit is not easy and it needs grit needs to be based on wellness basically that's mm-hmm. that's my answer but i try my best never to be misrepresentative of who i'm representing mm-hmm. i remember when i go into rooms you know i can say i'm still not 30 i will be 30 soon but i 30 is not my definition of old by the way mm-hmm. I, i'm a young woman and i represent a young sized migrant woman who was once living in deep poverty facing modern slavery this is who i'm representing and i always remember that and that i'm like sema you have to do your best in this room stay calm and collected do not give them what they want to 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 see Mm -hmm. because you're representing all these people and more of them needs to come in and i think more people come in people do realize how they are so biased and they were being crazy for thinking you were all that and you know when you're not basically mm-hmm. moving us and them i really hate us and them and mm-hmm. i tell people hey we are us us all of us keep reminding them and sometimes i have gotten great results you know i worked with you know not in our charity i worked with a lot of um during this job i faced a lot of racist people like outright racist they haven't seen the any problem with their issues like anything that they said and the more people like me stood up, then I think some of them were able to actually see how problematic they were being. Mm-hmm. And then they actually turned around. So I think there is a real hope around doing it's not the minoritized people's job to train or educate anyone who's racist. But I think by standing our ground, not taking it and continuously going for, you know, any job that we want to do mm-hmm. that just shows people we're not gonna go away. This method is not working anymore. Mm-hmm. Thank you so much. That's really, that's really, really helpful advice. Um, yeah, I'll let someone else answer the question. But I do have other ones, so let's see. Thank you, Hilary, and thank you, Sama. Um, we have a question from Sophie as well, who wanted to ask about making progress from a beginning point. And she asked, how do you build your resume and abilities from that start point? Um, I think for me I can answer how I did it I think there's no one guide to these things how I've done it I'm a very curious person I'm very curious about like professionally about everything I want to be a shoemaker I want to review the legislation while also you know that I think you need a level of professional curiosity once you have that if you're interested in things and then you just go and do it just go and do it right and try to find people who are great at that thing that you want to do and once you work with them you will learn a lot because I worked with so many people who are just legends and you find them and you just ask questions you need to be curious and be open to being trained right be uh, an apprentice you know I had a I would say well for me if, you know as a millennial it feels like a lifetime I, I had a decade of career at this point it feels like 50 years my god I'm like the things I went for you have to go for things and remove the fear because one thing I've seen with people who had similar number of working years to me when they ask me hey why am I still not progressing why have I spent my 10 years doing this one thing which is okay you can start now but I'm like have you been curious have you been fearful and they're like I haven't been curious and yes I was scared but remember when you're scared of something you're actually not achieving that thing anyway so you might as well be not be scared go for it fail maybe and that's okay and then you will just do something else you need to be okay with rejection isn't that your number one friend i would say if you want to be successful especially in this field be amazing at being rejected right you have rejected me i'm curious why you can take that feedback perfect you take it in your pocket move along and do the next thing right and try to address if it's a legitimate concern then you move forward and you just build an amazing cv by doing that you just need to be able to be super curious go to people i really like that event that you put together and you were able to bring this author and so on so how did you do that and people will tell you you know oh i've done this and i've done that and really listen take notes and try to do what they are doing and learn if you're not sure about what you're doing it's okay there's a lot of mentors out there really great people who will help you out i actually have i would say in my current job now i have a database in my phone book my iphone i have 250 people i regularly talk to that means i talk to 250 people 
four times a year. So that's each quarter I speak to, you know, more than 50 people about various things. Hey, I want to do this. How would you go on about it? Because you've done it five years ago. And they're like, oh, easy peasy. And most likely they will also introduce you to someone. And I do that as well. When someone comes forward to me, hey, I've seen you do this five years ago. How did you do that? I'm like, oh, easy. But let me tell you the mistakes not to make as well. And you really listen. You need to be an apprentice about everything. And learning is never over. If you want to build a great CV, you will never stop learning. But if you think you're okay, you know it all, you know, you don't need to learn because I've got my degree. That's, you know, I learned everything then. You will have a good career, not a great one. You need to be continuously curious. Be okay with constantly reading, constantly learning, constantly networking. These are my, I would say, networking, learning, being curious and actually doing the work not being afraid and from a start point maybe if i haven't answered that i think just get a job in something that you're interested in i would highly advise against doing something you don't want to do so the best advice i got in my early career years was when somebody told me i've never worked anywhere that wouldn't take me anywhere so you have to be a bit self-centered about that do I have personal values invested in this place, right? It could be any job. And that could be about, I want to do this job because I want to pay my rent while studying uni. Fine. But could you be doing a job that pays your rent, but also that you could learn something out of, you know, takes you to the future sector, if that makes sense. And always keep it relevant. Stay in the relevant loop. And then the start point then becomes removed and you're not a starter anymore. I think as soon as someone's worked at any job for three months, you're not at start point. You know, you, you're on the journey, you're driving. Thank you. Um, I think Hilary had one more question. Um, we are running out of time. Um, but yeah, if Hillary, if you do still have a question, would you like to ask? I think it was mostly answered in, in that response. It was just more so when, when you're younger and you're starting out, how do you kind of get a good report? But I guess quickly, I could also ask, um, when you make mistakes, like for example, um, like what you mentioned, like sometimes things happen or, um, you aren't able to make a connection and stuff. Um, how do you find the resolution? to bounce back from that um, um, and how do you keep motivated? I am an easily discouraged person, right? I have an attention span of 10 seconds. So <laughs> I think it's about recognizing yourself. Look how I recognize myself, right? But I also bounce back so easily. And I, I thought, I, I think I built this grit from enough rejection, just, you know, being an other in this country for a long time. Just to give you an example, I've applied for 4,000 jobs in two months to get my first job in the UK. So when I hear people who often tell me, oh, I've applied for 10 jobs and none of them got back to me. Okay, and so, yeah, great. I can't see the problem here. When I mentor people and they're like, I'm discouraged. Okay, come to me and say you're discouraged when you've applied for a thousand and we will work on your discouragement. We'll take you out for a dinner and, you know, introduce you to some people and, you know, try to build up your courage. But you need to actually do that to be discouraged. I think we need to understand at what point do I reserve the right to be discouraged and really, really get to know ourselves, you know, knowing your weaknesses as well as your strengths. Because I know I have a short attention span, I figured out how to work my brain so well, you know. I will always have something on the background, for example. I will prioritize tasks, right? And these things really work. A great list really helps. I make a list and put the things I don't want to do at the very top. Because I know if I don't do them first, they're going to become a mountain. And when I'm doing these nice tasks, I will never be able to do them and enjoy them because, you know, there's that horrible task that I don't want to be doing, right? Like sorting out payroll. I hate it. But one must do it for people to pay, be paid, right? So do that first. So get it out of your system, right? A bit of uncomfort is good. And then you move to the comfort zone. And it's like a sandwich method. Do the good, the bad, uncomfortable, comfortable, and then do it in order. But I would say reaching out to people is really, really effective. You're not the first person to feel or have been through this. 
everything is collective in this world you know just like i've talked about fgm fgm is such a huge issue the known numbers are 200 million people going through this right so i i'm telling you whatever you're going through somebody else has gone through that or is going through that and there's communities of people out there ready to help one another there are systems built like nonprofits so don't don't just stay in isolation thinking oh it's about me and you know those toxic mindsets the you know the sentences we hear in our heads don't let them win because i i think for me the reason why i've become wildly successful and i like to talk very positively about myself as a woman because we need that is i didn't let the toxic thoughts in my head win as soon as i hear them i create an anti-thought which a therapist told me is a very healthy way to handle them right if you hear for example well hillary of course, you're not going to get that job. That job is not good for you. you. You're not good enough for that job. They will get somebody who's more, mm, okay, Hillary. Then you create the anti-thought saying, okay, Hillary, what makes you say that? I am Hillary who has done X, Y, Z. I have amazing traits. And if I must learn something, I shall go and do that, okay? And I'm just good enough for this job, just like anybody else. If there's somebody more experienced, well done to them. Then I will bounce and move on to the next job. I think it's really important that we keep that mindset and, you know, without getting into the toxic mindset, obviously, of constant positivity, which I also don't like, keeping your eyes on the price, right, where I want to go. Because when I think about who I was when I came to this country and how vulnerable I was, I'm like, I had no furniture. I ate on the floor for two bloody years. And I'm just like, that is like mind blowing to now Sema, right? And I'm thinking, I was only able to do this and build myself all the security and success because I kept my eyes on the prize. I thought one day you will eat on a beautiful French dining table, the food that you wanted to buy, right, from any supermarket that you want to. You just need to keep thinking about that, put the work in and reach out for help. Right? Be part of a community and don't just suffer and accept what you're given. Does that answer your question? I don't know. It, it was the perfect answer. It's, it's really inspiring stuff. Thank you so much. Because I think you've also addressed certain things that I struggle with personally. Like, I don't always reach out for help when I need it. I kind of just, I'm, I'm not going to do it on my own. I'll just suffer on my own. And then you get burnt out. Um, so so it's really it's really important things for me to hear. I'm, I'm writing it all down as you're talking. <laughs> and yeah, reach out to Sam. I'll personally help you. Thank you so much. Whatever it is, right? We will, we will sort you out. Sam and Okay. Dog. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank you. Okay, and one final question that we have is, what advice would you give to your younger self? Oh my God, I think my younger self, I would love for my younger self, you know, sitting on a pavement, hopeless, like, but still, you know, working really hard. I used to work really, really hard, like to the point I had no personal life as a kid, studying really hard, being a bursary kid, you know, going to a school where everybody else is like wildly rich and you're in that classroom because somebody from you gave you a funding for you to be there. And I was just thinking at those times, I'm actually trying, but I don't know if I'm going to make it, but I'll still keep trying, keep my eyes on the prize, but I don't know actually if I'm going to make it, but Never in a million years, if now Samuel Gornall went back in past and met my even like 18 year old self, that one, that woman would be like, young woman, wow, who are you? I want to be like you. This is so cool. And I would just say, keep going. What you're doing is amazing. You're doing a great job. And whatever you're, you're thrown at, you know, whatever you're subjected to, will no longer be the case because you will get out of here you will get out of this you'll be very successful and you just have to keep investing in yourself investing in your education your well-being and your rights as a girl child as a young you know woman and, I, and that's what i would say to you keep you kick ass you keep doing that you know Thank you so much. That was so inspirational and I really enjoyed listening to you and I'm sure everyone else did. Um, and yeah, I think I'm going to hand it over to Rabina now for closing remarks. <laughs>